Welcome to the first lesson of AP Human Geography. My name is Mr. Collins, and I understand that you're probably a ninth grader, you are new to high school, and you are probably new to AP courses. And also you may be new to taking video lessons like this one right here. I understand. Let me give you some tips on expectations. First of all, you need to take notes. I will try to stop the video and tell you and pause it and to tell you to write this down. By you writing it down, it helps you to tell your brain that this is important. Otherwise, it'll just be 45 minutes of, oh, that was kind of interesting, but you need to you need to write stuff down so you know what's important. Okay, you also need to write stuff down so you can have it for later. Okay. Second of all, as a teacher, I am required to watch lots of videos and I'm supposed to answer lots of questions. I know all the tricks. So if you're just trying to watch this video to make me think you did, good luck. Besides, why are you trying to pull one over on me anyway? Watch the video, learn what you need to do, stop playing games. I mean, if you hate the class that much, get out of here, okay? I don't mean to be ugly. I'm just saying that please don't play games with me. I understand your desire. You think you're being efficient. I respect that. Don't do it, okay? Efficiency is not always the best way to learn. Sometimes it's the slowness that helps, okay? So accept my words as encouragement and positivity. I'm not trying to dog on you, okay? I'm just trying to set the tone and set expectations. All right, so be ready to take some notes and just be aware some of this is interesting, some of it's not, but we're gonna get through it, okay? This is our first lesson. Now the college board, that's who makes the AP courses. They divided the course up into seven units and each unit is like 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1 1.3. You don't need to worry about what is what, but I want you to know that I'm being very organized in how I teach you this stuff, okay? Everything I do is for a reason, okay? So let's get moving here. All right, so 1.1, types of maps and other things that happen with maps. So let's go ahead and get started here. Okay, don't write all of this down but write maybe just the big letters like reference maps and then political, physical, and road. I don't think you, know, you need to write anything more than that. But when you look at a map that shows, it shows you the location of where something is. That's a reference map, okay? We're gonna look at a lot of maps in this class as you can imagine, but if you're just looking at where stuff is, then it, that's a reference map. And it could be uh, a road map, tell you where the roads are. It could be a physical map, uh, where the water is. And then political map, like where the state line is, where the country line, where the country's borders are. Those are political maps. Okay, that's it. That's all I've got to say about it. I wouldn't write down too much, but I'll pause the video for you and you can do that. Okay, moving right along. So here's an example of a reference map. If you want to know where the stunt jumps are in Los Santos, uh, in San Andreas, then there you go. Okay, that's a reference map. This is a reference map. It's a road map. This is a reference map. It's a political map. Okay. This is also a reference map because it shows you where rivers are. Okay, some of y'all are like, so what? These are just maps. I get it, but I'm gonna show you a lot of maps that aren't reference maps. Okay, you're gonna, you're gonna need to know what all of these words mean. Now, do you need to know that they are thematic maps? Honestly, probably not. You're, but you will need to know what all of this stuff means, and I'm going to teach it to you right now. So be ready to take some notes, okay? But these are all thematic maps, okay? All right, choropleth maps. Choropleth, 
color. So I would define that. This is my definition. Choropleth maps, they use colors to illustrate something. Even if they're in black and white, you can still have a coral pleth map. You know, you can have like different shades of gray and stuff like that. As you know, on a paper test, it's always different shades of gray. So here is a coral pleth map. What is it talking about? And you need to learn how to analyze maps like this. Countries by mean wealth. That means average wealth per adult in 2018. So think about it. What are some of the richest countries on this map? Okay. What would be a poor country on this map? Okay, you need to be able to answer questions like that. You, you need to be able to analyze coral pleth maps. And you need to know, you need to be vaguely familiar with what is a coral pleth map. It color, coral pleth color. Let's go back one slide. Here is uh, always read the title of every map. Mean years of schooling. Mean means average. So why is this map important? Well, let's say you worked for Apple and Apple is paying you $300,000 a year to find where the next chip factory is going to be. And you need a place where people are educated and their labor isn't too expensive. So right now, a lot of that labor is happening in China, but the most highest level of chips are being made in the United States. Lower level chips are being made in China. And you see the education level in America is very high. Yes, I know that the American school system gets a lot of crap, but let's be honest, if you wanted to be an engineer, you could do it. And you could make $300,000 a year if you wanted to be an engineer, you could go to school. You can't do that in every country. Okay, so that's the kind of things that you need to know when you look at a map like this, how to analyze it. Okay, here's another coral pleth map. This one's about black populations and Hispanic populations. So as you can see, a lot of Latinos live in the South and Texas and Southwest. After all, this used to be Mexico. But it's not just people from Mexico, it's also South American migrants, things like that, and their ancestors. And then over here, you've got African American population. Okay, in East Texas, you have both. Florida, you have both. Up here, you don't have a lot of either. Okay, so something to think about now. Now, let's not forget. And I'm saying this because there's a question on your exam coming up where you need to be able to understand this, but in big cities like New York City up here, there are like hundreds of thousands of Latinos and African Americans, but they don't show up because of the percentage, because there are so many people in New York City that even they're not as big of a percentage, okay? So keep that in mind. I would assume this is a coral pleth map. This is the 2020 election results. Joe Biden, Donald Trump. Okay. Here's another example of a thematic map. I would assume this would be a coral pleth map. This is a lot like the one we saw earlier, Hispanic population percentage. Okay, it's a lot like the one we saw a minute ago. Okay, here's another one, dot density map. 
I don't really know what you would write down for that, but basically you get a map with a bunch of dots and then you analyze the clusters of dots. So here's an example, gun violence in Cincinnati, Ohio. So if you look at it, you can look for clusters. So if you worked for the police department and you noticed that this area is having lots of gun violence, then you would send more cops to that area. That is how people use geography. That is a geographic skill. Using these maps to drive decisions. Here's another dot density map, lightning deaths. Notice the blue dots versus the purple dots. And you wonder why women live longer than men. <laughs> okay, and notice, notice the state of Florida has so many lightning deaths. So if I were trying to prevent lightning deaths, I would go to Florida or maybe up here, okay? But the point is, is that um, it happens there. Maybe men out fishing in the middle of the lake and then they get struck. Maybe that's what it is, okay? U.S. public libraries, so you know where the libraries are. Now, what are you gonna do with this information? I don't know. You could argue that people up here are more educated than people out here. I don't know if that's a good argument, but it's an argument. But that's how you use a dot density map and analyze it. Here's another type of map, graduated proportional symbol. I don't think you need to know the term, but you need to know how to read these things. So this is the kind of map where they have a symbol, usually a circle, and the bigger the symbol, the, the more um, prominent or common it is in that area. Largest foreign born group in each county. So here you've got Latinos, you've got Cubans and Puerto Ricans. In Texas, lots of Latinos. The red circles are Latino. Blue, that would be Russia and Eastern Europe. So up here, you get a lot of hot dogs and beer, very Eastern European kind of things. Green would be Canadian. Okay. Here's another proportion, what's it called? A uh, graduated proportional symbol map. So this is on oil consumption. So which states use the most oil, consume the most oil? Okay. I wanted to show you one that isn't a circle. Divorces in the Czech Republic. I don't really know what what the, why this would be important. I mean, after all, cities are going to have more than than countries. But I just wanted to show you the map. Population of Native Americans. I was a bit surprised at. What we have here and up in, I wasn't surprised about Oklahoma, and I'm not surprised about this over here. But yeah. So the bigger the circle, the bigger the amount of people. This is the blue circles are Obama. This is from the 2008 election. The blue circles are for Obama and the red circles are for John McCain. He was a Republican. So where do the Democrats live? They live up here. 
and then over here. Where do Republicans live? Down here. All right, another type of map is a cartogram. Sizes are distorted to make a point. Distortion, you need to know the word distorted or distortion. It means it's kind of messed up in some way. For example, which one of these African countries has a large population? Well, look, Nigeria, but if you look at a political map, Nigeria is not that big, but over here it's very big. Why? Because Nigeria has 200 million people. Ethiopia has over 100 million people. So the bigger countries are exaggerated on this cartogram. So these are cartograms. Here's um here's another cartogram. You may recognize Africa. This is the rest of it. India and China are about the same population nowadays. At about one and a half billion people, maybe more. The United States has 320, about 330 million people. This map was in 2018. So it's a little outdated. So this is a cartogram. Map size is distorted to make a point. Here's another cartogram. World map of organic agriculture. So which country has a whole lot of organic agriculture? Look at that, that's Australia, and it looks very distorted. Here's another cartogram, this is GDP. What is GDP? It's a measure of the economy. So which country on this map has the best GDP? Okay, that would be the United States. Here's some more cartograms. Which states have the most Walmarts, McDonald's, Starbucks? All right, write this down, Isoline map. Now, if you're getting tired, hit pause, go take a break and come back. But don't just start tuning me out, okay? I get it. Sometimes um, you get tired. But you need to write this down. An isoline map uses lines to show things like temperature and altitude. Okay, so you've seen temperature maps a lot. And the lines show air masses. Okay, write this down up here. If you want, write this down. But you need to know what a topographical map is. What is a topographical map? It shows altitude using bumps or lines. Now, if you don't know what altitude is, then you should pro you need to write something down. Altitude is how how many feet above sea level or below sea level is something. Dallas is 420 feet above sea level. Albuquerque is 7,000 feet above sea level. The beach is zero feet. Death Valley, California is 282 feet below sea level. Okay. So here's a nut. So this is a topographical map and an isoline map. Don't forget isoline map. Isoline maps have lines. Both of these are topographical. 
as they show altitude. Here's a topographical and a climate map. Notice East Texas has a different climate than West Texas. This is an isoline map that is a topographical map. And it's weird, if you stare at this long enough, you can start to see the bumps and the hills. So when the lines are cl very close together, you get cliffs. When they're far apart, it gets flat. So this is all very bumpy over here. So this is an isoline map and a topographical map. Another isoline map. All right, so take a moment and let's apply your knowledge of this isoline uh, topographical map. Where would you set up camp? Where is the land the flattest? Okay, so number one or number seven would be just fine. Two is okay. Okay, all right, moving right along. Here's another cl climate zone map. Okay, so now on these videos, I try to have some multiple choice ready for you to go. Here's one for you right now. The map shown above best fits which of the following map types. Okay, and the answer is, the answer is A, chloropleth. Okay. All right. All right. You need to know latitude and longitude. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Latitude lines are like a ladder. They, um, you know, they like go up and down like a ladder. Latitude is how far north you are of the equator or how far south you are of the equator. Longitude is how far east you are of the prime meridian or how far west you are of the prime meridian. Where is the prime meridian? It runs through England and West Africa. Okay. So what is the approximate latitude of Dallas? What is the approximate longitude of Dallas? So latitude lines. Dallas, about 33 degrees north. Dallas, about 97 degrees west. Okay. All right, write this down or at least summarize it. Absolute location is when you, usually it's latitude and longitude, but it could be for any kind of grid system. Absolute longitude is when you give some sort of coordinates for its location, the latitude and longitude usually. Okay, moving right along. Relative location is when you describe the location relative to something else. Like, I live next to Starbucks. I live in the street behind Tom Thumb. Where is Cowboys Stadium? Relative location, it's between Dallas and Fort Worth south of Interstate 30, or you can give an absolute location, 32.7 degrees north latitude, 97.09 degrees west longitude.
So this is the same thing I just talked about. It's just different. Same concept, absolute distance is exact and precise, like how many miles away something is. Relative distance has to do with like how fast things go, how fast you're going. Like if you were to say it's a two hour drive away, that's relative distance. I didn't teach that in person. Absolute direction, that's exact cardinal directions. I'm heading northeast. That would be absolute direction. Relative directions, turn left at target, then right at the stop sign. Those are relative directions. It's kind of the same concept. That's why I'm not having you write it down. I hope that's okay. Okay. So you need to be familiar with the word clustering and dispersal. Clustering is when things come close together. Okay. Dispersal is when things are spread apart. So if you're looking at a dot density map, are the dots clustered or are they dispersed? All right. Latitude and longitude may be used to determine which of the following characteristics of a place. Okay, the answer is absolute location. All right, moving right along. All right, I'm going to play this video for you. It is good, and you need to watch it. It's really good, okay? All right, here we go. If I want to turn this globe into a flat map, I'm going to have to cut it open. In order to get this globe to look anything close to a rectangle lying flat, I've had to cut it in several places. I've had to stretch it so that the countries are starting to look all wonky. And even still, it's almost impossible to get it to lay flat. And that right there is the eternal dilemma of map makers. The surface of a sphere cannot be represented as a plane without some form of distortion. That was mathematically proved by this guy a long time ago. Since around the 1500s, mathematicians have set about creating algorithms that would translate the globe into something flat. And to do this, they use a process called projection. Popular rectangular maps use a cylindrical projection. Imagine putting a theoretical cylinder over the globe and projecting each of the points of the sphere onto the cylinder surface. Unroll the cylinder and you have a flat rectangular map. But you could also project the globe onto other objects. And the math used by map makers to project the globe will affect the way the map looks once it's all flattened out. And here's the big problem. Every one of these projections comes with trade-offs in shape, distance, direction, and land area. Certain map projections can either be misleading or very helpful depending on what you're using them for. Here's an example. This map is called the Mercator Projection. If you're American, you probably studied this map in school. It's also the projection that Google Maps uses. The Mercator Projection is popular for a couple of reasons. First, it generally preserves the shape of countries. Brazil on the globe has the same shape as Brazil on the Mercator Projection. But the original purpose of the Mercator Projection was navigation. Navigate. It preserves direction, which is a big deal if you're trying to navigate the ocean with only a compass. It was designed so that a line drawn between two points on the map would provide the exact angle to follow on a compass to travel between those two points. I'm pausing for effect because there's a question I'm gonna show you where you need to remember this. If you go at a certain angle from point A to point B, then it's pretty accurate. This Mercator projection is good for navigation as long as you don't go too close to the North Pole or the South Pole. If we go back to the globe, you can see that this line is not the shortest route, but at least it provides a simple, reliable way to navigate across the ocean. 
Gerardus Mercator, who created the projection in the 16th century, was able to preserve direction by varying the distance between the latitude lines, and also making them straight, creating a grid of right angles. But that created some other problems. Where the Mercator fails is its representation of size. Look at the size of Africa as compared to Greenland. On the Mercator map, they look about the same size. But if you look at a globe for Greenland's true size, you'll see that it's way smaller than Africa. By a factor of 14, in fact. If we put a bunch of dots onto the globe that are all the same size, and then project that onto the Mercator map, we will end up with this. The circles retain their round shape, but are enlarged as they get closer to the poles. So that's the Mercator projection. When It's pretty okay near the equator, but once you get into higher latitudes or very far south latitudes near the South Pole, then it gets distorted. That's the problem with the Mercator projection. One modern critique of this is that the distortion perpetuates imperialist attitude of European domination over the southern hemisphere. Okay, the Mercator projection has fostered European imperialist attitudes for centuries and created an ethnic bias against the third world. Really? So if you want to see a map that more accurately displays land area, you can use the Gall Peters projection. This is called an equal area map. Look at Greenland and Africa now. The size comparison is accurate, much better than the Mercator. But it's obvious now that the country shapes are totally distorted. Here are those dots again so that we can see how the projection preserves area while totally distorting shape. So the shape's all messed up. Something happened in the late 60s that would change the whole purpose of mapping and the way that we think about projections. Satellites orbiting our planet started sending location and navigation data to little receiver units all around the world. Today, orbiting satellites of the Navy Navigation Satellite System provide round-the-clock, ultra-precise position fixes from space to units everywhere in any kind of weather. This global positioning system wiped out the need for paper maps as a means of navigating both the sea and the sky. Map projection choices became less about navigational imperatives and more about aesthetic, design, and presentation. The Mercator projection, that once vital tool of pre-GPS navigation, was shunned by cartographers who now saw it as misleading. But even still, most web mapping tools like Google Maps use the Mercator. This is because the Mercator's ability to preserve shape and angles makes close-up views of cities more accurate. A 90-degree left turn on the map is a 90-degree left turn on the street that you're driving down. The distortion is minimal when you're close up. But on a world map scale, cartographers rarely use the Mercator. Most modern cartographers have settled on a variety of non-rectangular projections that split the difference between distorting either size or shape. In 1998, the National Geographic Society adopted the Winkle Triple Projection because of its pleasant balance between size and shape accuracy. But the fact remains that there's no right projection. Cartographers and mathematicians have created a huge library of available projections, each with a new perspective on the planet, and each useful for a different task. The best way to see the Earth is to look at a globe. But as long as we use flat maps, we'll have to deal with the trade-offs of projections. And just remember, there's no right answer. If you yourself want to poke fun at the Mercator projection, you can do so by going to thetruesizeof.com which is a fun tool that allows you to drag around whatever country you want. Okay, so let's go there. Never mind. Okay. All right. So you need to know what our project projection is like how a round globe, a three dimensional globe, is projected onto a two dimensional piece of paper. And this leads to distortions. Okay. So when you take the world, which is pretty spherical, and you project it onto a two-dimensional piece of paper, you get, well, here you get the Mercator projection, okay? 
So these projections, they distort shape, they distort area, they distort distance and direction. Okay. All right, so make a note on the Mercator projection, the advantages and the disadvantages. Go ahead. All right, moving right along. If you need to pause, go for it. Now, and the film explained it already, the Mercator projection, the size is all distorted, especially near the poles. Okay. I don't think you need to know Peter's equal area, uh, but that's the one where the everything looks so, like a weird shape. Okay. But the size is right, but everything else is messed up. And the Robinson projection, I have seen this on the AP exam, so go ahead and take a note. All I really know about the Robinson projection is that it's pretty good. It makes compromises. It makes compromise. It's good. Notice that it's not rectangular. So everything looks pretty good in the Robinson projection. All right, moving right along. So as far as I know, this is the best one. All right. This one is interrupted, so it's almost like if you take the globe and and you, you know, you're 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 not going to get like a rectangular piece of paper. So this one wouldn't be good for navigation. I have not seen this on the test. So there are other projections, but Mercator and Robinson are the only ones that I have seen on the AP exam. So all maps are wrong. That's the point that I'm trying to make. Okay. All right, so we're almost done here. I'm not saying this is an easy question, but go ahead and answer it. The answer is B. I had to look this one up myself, I, but if it, uh, the only reason I got this right is because of the film that I just showed you. Okay, tough question. All right, here we go. Every map projection has some degree of distortion because, and the answer is A. That film did a good job of answering this question. Okay, that's why I show you films. All right, here we go. Which of the following is a characteristic of the Mercator projection? All right, go ahead and answer that one. The answer is A. All right, different question, same visual. Which of the following statements about the Robinson projection is correct? The answer is A. Hmm. I, I'm, I don't know what to say about that. I, I'm wondering about that. Okay. All right, moving right along. Every map projection has some degree of distortion because... Didn't I just do this question? Yeah, I already did that question. All right, that's enough for this lesson. Thank you very much.